Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who were able to not able to join us last week, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. My name is Roderick Ireland, and on behalf of the Justice George Lewis Ruffin Society, I want to welcome you to the second session of our Convocation on Criminal Justice Reform. Today's program gives voice to criminal justice professionals and their informed views on reform. Once again, we have an exciting, dynamic, provocative group of speakers, both locally and nationally. We hope that their dialogue will enlighten us and perhaps even call us to action. Today, we are honored to have as our keynote speaker, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who is not only a trailblazer and pioneer, but also a passionate advocate, activist, and leader. Before running for public office herself, she worked for Representative Joseph Kennedy and then for Senator John Kerry. In 2009, she was elected to the Boston City Council, becoming the first woman of color to be elected to the council in its then 100 year history. She served there with distinction for eight years. In 2018, she was elected to represent our state's seventh congressional district in the United States House of Representatives. And once again, she became the first woman of color to hold that position. It is noteworthy that Congresswoman Presley represents the most diverse and the most geographically asymmetrical district in our state. It includes the northern three quarters of Boston, most of Cambridge and parts of Milton, as well as all of Chelsea, Everett and Somerville. And Congresswoman Presley is the elected representative for all of the people in those communities. The recipient of a host of honors and awards, Congresswoman Presley is described on one of her websites as, quote, a dedicated activist who is devoted to creating robust and informed policies that speak to the intersectionality of her district's lived experiences. She believes that the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power and that a diversity of voices in the political process is essential to making policies that benefit more Americans." End quote. And in an article in yesterday's Boston Globe, written by Joan Venacci, Congresswoman Presley was described as, quote, probably the most powerful elected official in Boston, end quote. In a word, she is tenacious, fearless, persistent, focused, and committed. And it is my great honor and pleasure to present to you Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Justice Ireland, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, you know, whenever I'm, I'm introduced, I, I find myself uh, struggling because I think ultimately the most important thing about me is that I am uh, my mother's uh, child. May she rest in peace and power. And so um, if I'm uh, a steward of, of any uh, justice uh, and equity and healing uh, in my role as Congresswoman, I credit that uh, fully uh, to the role modeling of my mother, uh, the expectations that she had for me uh, and the foundation that she laid. Uh, it is wonderful to join the distinguished members of the Ruffin Society uh, today for this convocation. I thank you for extending the, the invitation, uh, especially that we come together and convene at such a time as this. Uh, we do find ourselves at a critical inflection point as a nation. A global pandemic, a pandemic-induced recession, which has brought unprecedented economic hardship, destabilizing our households, our communities, and all against the backdrop of a so-called reckoning on racial injustice. 
Uh, Reverend Barber has spoken often of this reckoning and like uh, Reverend Barber, I grew up in the church and I consider a reckoning to be something uh, epic of biblical proportion. And so if we are indeed in the midst of a reckoning, uh, then our response must be one that is deep, that is commiserate uh, with the hurt uh, and the injustice. We must be bold. I love that Reverend Barber says that this reckoning demands of us a reconstruction, a third reconstruction. So all of us in this moment have an opportunity, a moral imperative, a responsibility to be community builders, movement builders, justice seekers, lawmakers in the midst of this third reconstruction. I often say that policy is my love language. And that's because the inequities, the disparities, the persistent racial injustices are not happenstance. The hurt and harm that has been done to marginalized communities, Black Americans in particular, was precise. It was intentional. It was legislated, codified in our laws. And so this third reconstruction, we seek to be community and movement builders and justice seekers, requires that we be just as race conscious, in my opinion, just as precise, just as intentional. If we can legislate hurt and harm, I do believe that we can legislate equity, healing, and justice. As the Justice uh, Ireland uh, referenced, I have a practice, uh, more than a, a mantra, a practice, that the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power driving and informing the policymaking. Brian Stevenson speaks often about uh, being proximate. Uh, I seek intentionally to do that because I think by being in proximity to those closest to the pain, you better understand the complexities, the intersectionalities, the nuance. It's also where we can better harness uh, the best ideas and innovation. I think people that are hurting the most know best what they need. And ultimately, it is this symbiotic partnership, what I would characterize as cooperative governing, which will allow us to disrupt decades of what I consider to be policy violence. Again, in the midst of this reckoning on racial injustice, in my opinion, the only receipts that matter are policies and budgets. Budgets which codify the values of our lives and policies which seek to undo centuries of harm. This is our responsibility. This is the inflection point. This is a moment of reconstruction. As litigators and legislators, it is our responsibility again to do this work in partnership with community and to do it in a way that is unapologetically disruptive in the name of innovation, that is bold and deep and as far reaching as the hurt and harm has been. Again, policy is my love language. And so in that vein, I've used the power of the pen in many ways to attempt to exact justice to undo the hurt and harm that has been caused by our criminal legal system. I should add, as the daughter of a formerly incarcerated parent for some 14 years, I know the destabilization, at times even the shame, the stigma and the isolation of having an incarcerated loved one. Angela Y. Davis reminds us that a social problems do not go to jail, people do. Now, those people belong to families and broader communities and recognizing that given my own lived experience and how destabilizing that was to our own household. It's why I've introduced legislation like dismantle mass incarceration for public health because it is a public health crisis. When our loved ones are behind the wall and when we are treating as we have historically done as a nation, trauma with more trauma, this is destabilizing not only for the person that is incarcerated, but for everyone connected to that person. 
I've also introduced the People's Justice Guarantee, which is a radical reimagining and a, a new framework, if you will. It's a comprehensive decarceration focused resolution, which outlines a framework for a humane, equitable, and just legal system. This People's Justice Guarantee, what um, I hope will be a new North Star, was one that was close to and crafted in close partnership with those closest to the pain, along with uh, lawyers and advocates, community organizers, impacted families, and those behind the wall. The People's Justice Guarantee offers a vision of justice and serves as an intersectional guide for my legislative agenda, speaking to a range of issues from transit equity and housing justice to immigration and decarceration. Again, all of these uh, issues, the, the hurt and harm, the, the oppression has been uh, intersectional. If we are under investing in communities, if we are divesting from communities, we create conditions in an ecosystem where people can barely survive, much less thrive, and, and then do things to survive. And that behavior is criminalized, resulting in mass incarceration. That's why we have to decriminalize poverty, decriminalize homelessness, mental health, substance use disorder. Uh, my father, My father uh, self-medicated to treat a lifetime of trauma. He was uh, one of six. Uh, he and his siblings were, were orphaned um, early on. My father deserved a culturally competent, on-demand substance use disorder treatment, not for his disease to be criminalized, not to be away from his family. And so this is in broad strokes what the People's Justice Guarantee speaks to. And within that, um, I have other pieces of legislation. Again, policy uh, is my love language. I seek to replace systems of uh, oppression and, and hurt and harm with systems of, of liberation uh, that promote healing and equity and justice. In alignment with that, I've also introduced a bill to abolish the death penalty because I do not believe that state sanctioned murder is justice. I've introduced legislation uh, twice now uh, to end qualified immunity uh, against the midst of this reckoning on racial injustice while we see negotiations in the Senate for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill having collapsed. I, I remain uh, more committed than ever to ensuring that we do end qualified immunity. It's an unjust doctrine that has been codified in statute after statute. We know that there can never be justice because that would mean that the loved ones that we have been robbed of due to brutalization, lynching, murder, they would still be with us. There cannot be justice, but there must be accountability. For as long as there is qualified immunity, there will not be that accountability. There will be those in law enforcement that will operate with callous disregard of black and brown bodies with reckless impunity without any consequences. I've also introduced um, legislation to address the push out crisis, uh, the growing criminalization of, of our black girls. We have more girls justice involved and more women incarcerated than ever before. And this happens uh, very early. My thought leader in this work, Dr. Monique Morris, uh, says that we shouldn't call it the school to prison pipeline because it, it isn't linear. So these school to confinement pathways begin with policies that on their face appear to be uh, race neutral but have a disparate impact on our children, on our girls in particular, who are being criminalized and being uh, suspended, disciplined, expelled. At, in some instances, six times that, if not more, than their white counterparts, simply for how they show up in the world. We're talking about dress code policies, uh, hair code uh, policies. We need restorative justice practices. I've also introduced legislation counseling, not criminalization. In the last uh, two decades, we've invested $1 billion in growing our school police, $1 billion federal dollars. Meanwhile, 90% of our young people don't have equitable access to a school nurse, a social worker, or a guidance counselor. 
investment in those social emotional wellness supports, again, counseling, not criminalization, is critical to the health and wellness of our children and also their readiness to learn. This is one way that we uh, close and uh, combat the achievement gap. We need trauma-informed learning communities that when a child uh, shuts down given or acts out, given all that they're carrying in their emotional backpacks when they cross the threshold into our learning communities every single day, that someone is, is trained that has the wherewithal to ask, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? So these are just uh, some of the pieces of legislation out of the 91 bills in the last three years that I've introduced uh, using the power of the pen to seek to exact justice. And I thank all of you for uh, being my partners in this work. Uh, this is a very full circle moment uh, that I would uh, have the opportunity to offer uh, some remarks today to the George Ruffin Society and that I was the first a black woman and woman of color elected to the Boston City Council. I feel very much a beneficiary of the trail that was blazed by him. And so I thank you all for your partnership as professionals in the work of justice. We have the tools available to us to build this more just society, to radically reimagine our criminal legal system. We have the tools available. All we need is the political courage to make it real. So I thank all of you for the opportunity to say a few words today. And I hope that you will continue to see me as more than an ally in this work, but as an intentional accomplice and co-conspirator uh, in the work of justice. Until it is done, let us in earnest begin the work of reconstruction. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Presley. What a thoughtful, powerful, moving speech. You have given us so much to think about and so much to act on. We are all fortunate to have you representing us in Congress. And now it is my pleasure to present our convocation facilitator, Christine Cole, the executive director of the Crime and Justice Institute a division of Community Resources for Justice. As I mentioned last week, Christine is recognized as an authority and expert in criminal justice policy and management. She has engaged in safety and justice reform work with governments and international multilateral agencies in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the South Pacific. We're honored to have her join us again today. Christine Cole. Chief Ireland, thank you so much for that warm introduction. You know, we've spent 20 odd months on Zoom and the one thing I miss the most after you hear a speech like we just did from Congresswoman Presley is applause, right? Um, and if we were in a room together, I expect many of us would be on our feet. She is so inspiring. And I'm so pleased that uh, while she's not my representative in Congress, she's next door and still hails from my state. Um, that was really wonderful. And if she's not here, I hope her staff still are so that they can report back how, how wonderful that was. Um, so we've got some panelists who have a tough act to follow. So folks, I hope you're ready. Um, it's really a treat to be here. This is our second week um, out of three for the 21, 2021 convocation of the Ruffin Society. It's a great privilege to facilitate this panel of, of experts. And the folks that we have with us today represent several different aspects of our criminal justice system. We have, in addition to some long-term, long-time local experts, Yolanda Smith and Pamerson Eiffel. We're joined with, um, by Commissioner Bard, who led the Cambridge Police Department for the last four years, and a very special prosecutor from Minneapolis, Attorney General Keith Ellison. First off, thank you all for sharing your time and thoughts with us this afternoon. I wanna leave as much time as possible for the panel discussion, but I do need to give you a few words of introduction to each of our panelists. 
I'll be brief. Um, their bios are online. They're extensive and impressive. And I hope that you look on the Convocation website to learn more about each of our panelists. They have lots of accomplishments, lots of successes. And so we'll start with my introduction of each of them one at a time. Um, in alphabetical order, uh, Branville Bard, um, who serves currently as the president for, vice president, excuse me, for public safety at Johns Hopkins University. He spent 28 years in law enforcement, 24 in his hometown of Philadelphia, and then the last four here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Bard is known for his progressive approaches to public safety. Um, I love reading about him online. He talks about centering his work on integrity, follow through, and deepening relationships with the community in his efforts to collect, protect public safety and defend constitutional rights. Uh, Justice Ireland gave a quote from uh, Congresswoman Presley, a quote I found from uh, Dr. Bard is, we do not have to choose between being safer and sacrificing civil liberties with a public safety system centered on procedural and social justice and grounded in listening to the community's needs, we can do both. I think that's great. And I think it's a great setup for what we need to talk about today and is emblematic of what the George Lewis Ruffin Society represents. Dr. Bard, thank you for being with us. Next, I'll introduce Pamerson Eiffel. Um, please note the, the wall behind him. Um, he is the Deputy Commissioner for Pretrial Services in the Massachusetts Probation Department. I mentioned the wall behind him because he is the architect of the court's cultural proficiency efforts and the Cultural Appreciation Day, which grew into Cultural Appreciation Week. As a young person in Barbados, Hammerson experienced some personal loss and his future path seems to me to be influenced deeply by an encounter with a law enforcement officer. He's a Golden Gloves champion um, and names working with young people as one of his biggest passions. Um, Hammerson, thank you. Next, we'll go to Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison is the Attorney General for the state of Minnesota. He certainly became a household name for many of us with the recent prosecution of a police officer charged in the murder of George Floyd. General Ellison served Minnesota's fifth congressional district for 12 years, the first Muslim in Congress and the first African-American representative from Minnesota. Before being elected to Congress, General Ellison served four years in the Minnesota House of Representatives. He spent 16 years as an attorney specializing in civil rights and defense law, including five years as the executive director of the Legal Rights Center. Over his career, there's a theme of delivering justice for Minnesotans who had nowhere else to turn. General Ellison talks about valuing generosity and inclusion. General. Thanks for the work you do. Thanks for being on this panel. Last but not least, we go to Yolanda Smith. Um, Yolanda is the Executive Director of Public Safety at Tufts University. And boy, does she have a job. Uh, she leads the department that includes the university's emergency management, uh, safety and threat assessment management, emergency medical services, and police functions as if policing were not enough, right? You had to get all those other things in there. Um, Yolanda was most recently special sheriff in Suffolk County, Massachusetts in the Sheriff's Department and, and there founded and led innovative programs in the jail for women, LGBTQ folks and young people in order to expand services, to listen to the residents in the jail and to support their self-advocacy. Yolanda, again, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing what you do and congratulations on your new job. Each of you are bringing special gifts of time and, and spirit and your mind. So thank you all so very much. Um, we're gonna run this conversation for about an hour, a little more than an hour. And then we're gonna turn it back over to Chief Justice Ireland. Um, I have some questions for, for the whole group and I have some that may be targeted. This one I'd love for you all to answer. You know, we've heard from the Congresswoman today 
Um, you have your own experience. We, we read the news, we see the news. And, and certainly what we see today is that um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color have a deepening distrust in and lack of confidence in the criminal justice system. This may be most acute in policing, um, but certainly other parts of the system are not immune. Tell us, tell us what you're seeing from your vantage point and tell us what you're doing in your role or expecting your staff to do to address some of these systemic, systemic problems. I'm gonna go first to Pamerson and, um, and then we'll, we'll go around the room. Pamerson. Thank you, um, Christine. I appreciate the opportunity and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with this panel this afternoon. It was also a pleasure to hear um, Congressman Presley speak um, so eloquently about the things that are important to her, but also to the country. Now, in terms of, of, of what we're doing, I think, you know, I think there's no secret that, that there's been an acknowledgement by not only Chief Justice Gents before his untimely passing, but uh, as well as Chief Justice Kerry and um, Chief Justice Arlen Bilhorhin before them, them both about the issues of disparity, racial and ethnic disparity within the Massachusetts trial court system. And we just had a report that was released last November that pointed to that. And so we in the trial court have been intentionally, and this goes back to efforts, part of our strategic plan to address issues of racial and ethnic disparity. So there's a significant work that is coalescing around how are we approaching these issues? How are we approaching these topics? And I think in our work, especially within the trial court, we're really focusing on how we go about using data to inform the decisions that are made within the trial court. We're also using that data to better um, develop strategies and comprehensive approaches to how we reduce the disparity. And a lot of this is, you know, we're looking at training leadership across the board, as well as all of our staff about addressing these issues, about how we engage and treat the public, about high, level, about high levels of empathy and understanding. But I think a big part of this comes back to ensuring that we treat people you know, with, equal, with dignity and respect. How do we, call, we, we develop or, or provide the same equal access to justice outcomes? And I think you know, the Criminal Justice Reform Act of 2018 provided some really clear steps not only in, um, to the trial court, but for the rest of the criminal justice system and how to tackle and address these issues. And I think 11 different items fell to us. And, and this go everything from pretrial services, about our DNA collections, about our treatment, about juvenile justice reform, about you know, bail costs and the disparate impact that it have on communities of color. And so I think the trial court has taken some really intentional steps to address the disparities that we have that exist in the system. Thanks so much. You know, I meant to say this can be a conversation among us. It doesn't have to just be question and answers. So feel free to, um, you know, pull off of what um, some of your fellow panelists have said and uh, really engage with one another. Um, Keith, what are your thoughts with that that question I put out there or response to Pamerson? Yeah, it's a great question. I appreciated Pamerson's uh, observations. You know, at the Attorney General's office. What we're trying to do is use the office to help people afford their lives and then make sure everybody lives with dignity, safety, and respect. That's what we're trying to do. And uh, to that end, uh, from a criminal justice standpoint, uh, first thing is that you know we, we prosecute people who commit crimes, whether they have a badge or not. And so it is true that we led the prosecution on Derek Chauvin convicted him of three counts. And, um, and we have other cases like that, but we prosecute other people who, uh, who have harmed or violated the criminal laws of our state. Uh, we're, we're simply applying equal justice under the law. And uh, we're not going to uh, say that some people are above the law and no matter what they do, they never have to face uh, accountability and some people are beneath the law. So you can do anything you want to them and nobody's ever gonna say anything about it. We don't, we reject that one standard of justice. But then, you know, as attorney general's office, you know, we're, we started a, a conviction review unit where we have prosecutor led um, examinations of credible claims of innocence. We're also taking up unfair sentencing and uh, give you a quick example of what that is. 
is uh, take, for example, you have a man and a woman who commit a crime. The man says, this dude owes me money, goes into the store, puts the gun on the guy, shoots him, and then hands her the gun and says, do something with this. He pleads guilty to murder and whatever and gets an out date. In Minnesota, there's no death penalty. He, if he pleads guilty, they might take first degree murder off the table. He might be doing a long time, but he's going to get out. She says, I didn't do anything. And I'm going to trial, loses, gets life without the, life without the possibility of parole. That seems to me an unjust sentence. We're, we're, we're going, we're, we're prosecutor initiated efforts to correct injustices like that. We set up a statewide expungement program. So anybody in the state of Minnesota, if you qualify, uh, we'll do your expungement. We'll work with the county attorneys to help get your case expunged. Now, not everybody's eligible, no crim sex, no DUIs, but you know, your, your, your low level drug possession offense from 10 years ago should not lock you out of the economy and out of an apartment to live in. And we're trying to do something about it. Oh, and it's free, which is a good price. So the other thing, we started a wage theft unit. We found that there's a, a fair number of employers who say, yeah, we're gonna pay you 11 bucks an hour, but then they make you work through your breaks, but then they deduct those breaks from your pay. That's wage theft. And that happens at the lower end of our economy with lower paid folks. And uh, just last week, we got about 230, thousand dollars back from an employer who was uh, systematically uh, taking money from the most least the people who, who couldn't afford to lose a penny because they're already not getting paid much uh, and we also are focusing our attention on housing and uh, historically the attorney general's office has not seen tenants as cus consumers but of course they are right they consume housing services so uh, we we took we just filed suit on several of them both in greater Minnesota and in the city of Minneapolis. And, um, you know, we're taking those landlords to, to court uh, in the civil realm, uh, but we're making sure that uh, they don't have illegal terms in their lease. They don't threaten to retaliate if you call inspections, that they fix things on time and, and, and uh, making sure that people are treated with justice. If you heard some of the cases that we uh, sued this particular landlord around you, it would break your heart. You know, you would wonder, you know, how in the world could somebody do this? One, one lady told us that she uh, could not use the bathroom. The squirrels had completely taken it over and that she could not go in there. And if she were, she'd be afraid to get bit by rabies and she would not let her children in there. She could not have any food outside of the refrigerator because if it were not, uh, if it were just in a cupboard, um, pests would get it, you know, and uh, you know, this same landlord, you know, would, would say things like girls don't have to pay full price um, and you don't even have to, you know, would talk really rude to them, things like that. And it was mostly all black women and their kids. But that's just the inner city ones. But the ones in greater Minnesota, not much different, you know, but uh, we're, 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 we're trying to make sure that you can live safely and get the money that you are paid. And that's what we mean by afford your life. We've also taken action on, uh, you know, dealing with the high price of pharmaceutical drugs. Um, and there's more to be said, but I'm curious to hear what my colleagues on the panel are saying, so I'll pass it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for talking about what you meant by afford their lives with the wage unit and the tenants, because that was, I had that was my follow on question. Um, the um, are the wage theft units and the work you're doing on behalf of tenants, are those unusual for an attorney general's office, to your knowledge? Yeah, well, well, there's this really brilliant woman named Terry Gerstein who's been going around the country to every AG's office at trying to get us to establish wage theft units. Right. About five of us have them, and there are more coming. I think that Maura Healy has one, uh, but, uh, we're, we're, you know, but it, is a, it is somewhat of a new development. Um, right. But at the yeah, but I'd just point out that you know we're talking about race today. Imagine how much uh, racism blows through the economy. If somebody says you can't live here because you're black, well, uh, that that is effect that has affected your economic circumstances. Sure if you if if you have uh, get taken in by a for college pro uh, for for profit college that is uh, get, you know saddle you with a lot of debt and not giving you any academic certificates, that's, uh, that's, you've suffered economic harm. 
if you have if you're playing full price on an apartment but you know you get but it has it's an extremely bad repair and you get abusive treatment by the landlord that's an economic harm so much so much in, in the wage issue is clear economic harm so you know it, one of the things we've got to do is reduce the racial wealth gap help people save some money help people put some uh put the, and so often when we talk about black economics we talk about it from a entrepreneur standpoint and you know set asides and all that's totally fine and i'm all for that but what about the average working class person working in that factory that warehouse working in that fast food place they have they deserve prosperity too in this richest country in the world here 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 um Branville, you look like you're ready to speak you're off mute yeah uh, thanks Carol. So yeah, I appreciate everything everyone said. And I, I, this, I'm in my 29th year in law enforcement and public safety. And I love this profession, but I'm not blindly loyal to it. And I see its shortcomings. So when we talk about reform, I'm here for it. For nearly, nearly three decades, I've seen uh, this profession fail to meaningfully reform itself. I've seen this profession fight against any and all uh, efforts aimed at holding it accountable and placing checks on its authority and power. And guess what? No community is going to truly trust an entity with that much power and authority that it does not believe it can hold accountable, particularly one that it sees as fighting against every measure aimed at holding it accountable. So, you know, I always say that as a profession, we get indignant when we should be getting introspective. Um, no community is going to trust an entity that isn't reflective of it or inclusive of it. And uh, that's not to say that an individual of one race can't dutifully police a community of another race, um, but inclusivity, inclusivity uh, certainly helps to engender trust. As a student of public administration, I learned that it's the duty of the elected and the appointed to limit government's ability to harm or abuse its citizen. And when we hear reform, when I hear reform, aren't we really just talking about limiting the potential for harm? Um, I believe that we should view every policy, practice, and procedure through a lens of how protective it is of our most vulnerable population. In my opinion, most individuals who we encounter the vast majority of them, the overwhelming majority of them, even when a criminal statute is violated, are better served through a social justice process than more traditional criminal justice methods, which tend to be overly, overly punitive. Um, especially when we know or, or, or should accept this fact that at every key decision-making point throughout the entire criminal justice system, minorities are disparately impacted. So uh, that's why in Cambridge, a city that was already you know, progressive, and uh, reform-minded and already uh, favoring prevention, intervention, and diversion over uh, more punitive message, uh, methods. It, um, I started our family and social justice section where we um, employ licensed clinicians, social workers to help us better protect vulnerable populations. That's our young folks, our elderly, um, our homeless, and those suffering from mental health and substance use issues. Um, I'm a social scientist. I believe that our biggest failures in law enforcement are uh, surround you know, those issues that cause the most distrust. That's race and transparency. So um, you know, I started our procedural justice section and my scholarly work is, design, is about uh, designing metrics to identify and eliminate racial profiling and racially biased policing. So when I hear the term reform, I'm here for it. And, and I really stand here unapologetically protective of the people who I've been sworn to serve. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that policy review that you've done? I know you're relatively new in your job now, so you probably haven't had a chance to do everything you want to in these short months, but um, tell us about the kind of process you use to review policies, to look at them through the lens of those most likely to be impacted by them. Right, so it's about being protective. And, um, and, it, and it's not, you know, a, a, a True, truly scholarly Pareto evaluation where you think that, you know, you should look at a policy and think of um, no individual should be harmed by it. And then, you know, it should, you know, create positive impacts, but you have to consider how it impacts others and everyone. And when you look at it and how it considers others and everyone, then it forces you to make determinations. And, and Congresswoman uh, Presley said it, very well. <laughs> these policies intentionally, I mean, you can't not know that some of these policies are harming your most vulnerable populations. So when you go ahead and enact them, that means, in my opinion, that you looked at their potential for harm 
and considered it and ignored it. So, but what I also focus on is that policy is one arm of it, but what's truly important or more important when in law enforcement is culture. Because when you understand the nature of culture to policy, culture is going to eat policy, for, you know, for breakfast. You have to have leaders who are resolved to change the culture. You can have on policy that it, you can have a policy on paper that might just be a mere platitude on a page. If saying that you ban chokeholds, if supervisors overlook when their officers employ chokeholds, so the culture has to enforce the, the policy. So I don't want to ramble, but yeah, We're it's, gonna, all, it's all intertwined and it's all important. No, it is. It's great. We're going to come back to culture in a little bit. Um, Yolanda, I want to get you in the conversation. Tell us what you're thinking here and all this. Thank you, Christine. I, um, I come with two lens. Um, I spent 26 years in corrections. So I um, intended to be there uh, to as a stepping stone or a launching pad into policing, but realized I, uh, I, I, I could nurture my best attribute, which is advocacy. And so, um, you know, as the special sheriff, I, I, I was able to create space and forums for people to hear the experts in the criminal justice system, which are the people who are remanded to custody, um, hear their sight, hear their insight, and hear how punitive things have been for them throughout the system. And you know that that's a hard thing for them to do because they fear retaliation. But you know we we went into that with open ears to listen, not to defend, but listen to understand, and to understand the and, and see the racial and social and economic harm that incarceration had caused. Um, we talked to, you know, we learned, and I think we knew this, but it, it, it's so validating to hear um, those experts, which are those people who are remanded, custody, remanded to custody to tell us how much um, criminal, criminalizing food and housing insecurities had affected not only them, but their families and, and their communities. So, you know, I think the, from that perspective, um, folks in law enforcement, and I'll speak specifically about corrections, we have come a long way, but we have such a long way to go. We need to be sure that our policies and practices aren't laced with um, biases um, that are uh, institutional, cultural, and structural. And, 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 and that's super important. And now I wanna pivot um, and that's to be better and, and, and to treat those folks better and, and really prepare them to get back into society. And then I pivot and, and talk about where I am today, which is the, I am the executive director of uh, public safety at Tufts University and, I, and also the chief of police. So I come to higher education, which is a completely different arena. And what I have done and what I intend to do is to continue to listen and, and, and listen with, a, with humility and empathy about how these constituents and stakeholders have been made to feel by today's policing. And understand that and be able to create space so that we collaboratively come up with better models on how to treat folks and how to coexist. Um, so, you know, I'm three months in <laughs> and, um, and we are amidst a, an arming study. Should Tufts University remain armed, uh, a, a police department that is armed? And so, you know, that has been, this, is, this process being in, a part of the study has been um, very, very enlightening for me because, you know, when we have open forums and focus groups, you really learn how people feel, people who have lived adverse, lived bad experiences with police. And so if we're gonna make this huge reform that everyone wants to see, we have to stop defending and listen and come up with holistic collaborative um, uh, ideas and worldviews on how we want police, what we want policing to look like. And um, I just want to say about the young students here at Tufts University, they are energetic, they are motivated, 
and they are moving this conversation, whether we want them to or not. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just happy to be a part of this and happy to be a part of this conversation about what reform and the criminal justice system should look like. Great, thanks. Let's stay with that theme that um, several of you have raised, which is culture, right? And so when you, I love that you say, Yolanda, let's stop defending and listen. Um, when I think about Keith talking about conviction integrity reviews or conviction reviews, um, that's, a, that's so important. We know that there have been race bias in juries and in prosecutions for generations. And yet it's a culture change. So I'm curious to hear about how police are responding in Minnesota to that. Um, and, and I invite Granville to jump in on this conversation too. And that the, um, each of you have been part of culture, culture changes. I know that the probation department in Massachusetts has been a decade or so changing culture, embracing evidence-based practice, talking about equity and inclusion in ways that they hadn't before, the whole court process. Um, but there's pushback, obviously, when we talk about culture change. And, and Yolanda, you specifically saying, stop, you know, stop defending. How is this process going? What are you doing to help the officers in particular that work for you to listen and hear the needs of your community? so that they can be open, more open to um, change. Is that for me? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, so yes, thank you. So um, as I get to learn in uh, my staff and, and understand um, perspectives, what is very um, obvious and paramount to me is that I create space for them to understand the need for um, empathy and healing amongst our community. And so that sometimes comes with, you know, outside training being, being brought forth, um, having one-on-ones with each of them to understand their perspectives and, and, and where they're coming from and, and what their view of reform looks like. So, you know, it's been very, very busy for me um, just trying to understand um, the culture here and how amenable staff are, officers are, to um, progression, um, uh, progressive policing, um, policing that does not look like the traditional policing that we've all grown accustomed to. So I think that we have a long road ahead of us, but I do believe that together, the officers, myself, um, the stakeholders and constituents of Tufts, we're gonna work together and we're gonna listen. We're gonna listen with open ears and open hearts so that we can understand where we need to move forward, where we need to be and, and how we're going to do it. And again, I, um, you know, <laughs> I had a student and I'll be brief. I had a student walk up to me and say to me, you know, uh, Ms. Smith, we're glad you're here at Tufts, but I just want you to know the community doesn't really trust you. Um, we think your optics, you know, and I, and we'd hate for that to be, be the case. And I thought that was the most profound thing that anyone had ever said to me here at Tufts because he spoke his truth. And so, you know, my, my, my response to him was real simple. I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm asking, I, I want, I want to show you that you can, and together we'll do this together and, and create a police department that will, uh, will ring true of everyone's voices of, of what it should look like. And that's really dismantling biases and, um, and, and racial harm that have uh, been prevalent. Yeah, and optics is an important thing. Maybe we'll try and get back to that too, because uh, it's, um, it's a bit insulting. Um, <laughs> Keith, let's talk about the uh, conviction integrity reviews. You used a slightly different name, but I think it's the process that's the same. And police are some of your um, important constituents and stakeholders. Um, and, and yet, as, as Branfield said, we want to get this right. We're all in for reform. Uh, how are people managing this? Well, um, so I deal more with my county prosecutors. Sure. Uh, and of course, the police are part of the conversation, but my biggest, uh, my, my, my constituency group that I've got to engage are prosecutors. And so um, in Minnesota, 
Uh, I don't have original jurisdictional criminal cases. They refer them to me all the time, but uh, the 87 county prosecutors are the ones who handle the bulk of the cases that come through the door. And so uh, when I say, and then, and then often they will refer cases to us, and there's only about seven counties in Minnesota where if somebody, where if there was a murder or a sex trafficking case um, or a complicated crim sex case, that they would be able to handle it. You, so we get a lot of calls. Okay, so when you when we say that some, there's that there's legitimate proof of innocence, clearly uh, you're talking you're talking about a prosecutor, maybe in my office, maybe in a county attorney's office, who's invested heart and soul into getting this conviction, right? right? And they're they so so they're not meeting it with gladness, right? I've been so. What have I? My strategy has been let's uh, let's let's talk about what we're going to do. Let's talk about what it's going to look like. Let's talk about what our threshold is. Get a lot of input, and then know that our first case, and we've already had some first cases, but our first case is going to be a big deal because that's what's going to signal to people what kind of cases we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, and then of course I've got to be clear. You know, if you have convict, if you violated the law and hurt someone, uh, kill somebody, took somebody's family member away, I'm not sympathetic to that, right? But we don't want anybody in prison who didn't do it, because that's a double that's a double problem, because that means an innocent an innocent person is incarcerated, and it means a guilty perpetrator is out to do more harm. So the only person who benefits from convicting the innocent is the is the guilty who escaped accountability. So with that, you know, it has been going along fine, but it's mostly a lot of relationship building. And, um, you know, the difficult case is, I mean, if you got a case where the science is wrong and there's no and you can't blame the prosecutor, we, you know, you take like the, the advancement in science of, say, shaken baby syndrome or some other thing where we thought that there was this was a this was a crime but now science is changing now we know it may not be then nobody's really at fault and it's like sorry but if you have a situation where there was a what they you know the folks are the criminal justice people will know what I mean but but like if there's a Brady violation and you know or if there's some sort of truly bad conduct then uh me I <laughs> I'm I'm already to be in conflict with some folks, and um, you just gotta. It's just the way it is. And, and I have an advantage, and I'm gonna tell you what my advantage is. I'm not in love with being the attorney general. I like my job. I plan on running for re-election. If the voters see me doing want me to do something else, I do something else. I was in Congress for 12 years, had absolutely no opposition, and left voluntarily because I thought I could do more good in this job. And so I'm not going to back, I don't wanna be the governor. I don't care to be the Senator. I'm the least ambitious politician you ever met. So that helps me do what I think is right. Uh, and so, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'm sincerely wrong. And which means I'm open to being educated. But like, if I'm hearing that, you know, you, know, you used a lot of nasty pressure tactics on a juvenile who asked repeatedly for his mom and you said no, and it went on for 12 hours, and finally you get him to say that he did it, and that's the only evidence you got. Sorry, buddy. I can't stand with you on that. Yeah. I don't care what you call me, and you can run against me if you don't like it. Branville's body tells me, his body motions tell me he's uh, right on board with you. Um, you not only have um, prosecutors who put their heart and soul into getting a conviction, but you have police officers who sometimes have tunnel vision and are looking for somebody to arrest. Uh, how do you ward against that, Branville? How are you responding to the increasing numbers of conviction integrity units that are, that are checking on this behavior? It's important. I, I couldn't agree more with what the uh, General Ellison says. We don't want people incarcerated if they didn't do it. Oh, absolutely not. And as far as reform, you know, I, I take the approach in, throughout my career where I, I like to show folks the benefits of taking a certain course of action, um, that protective stance. But at the end of the day, you ain't got no choice. I'm the boss 
And, you know, you're either going to do it my way, you're going to do public safety and law enforcement my way, a, a protective stance, or you're going to go do it somewhere else. So um, that's it. When it comes to uh, attorney generals and, and district attorneys, like the phenomena that we talk about now, aggressive DAs, um, I'm one of the minority of, of uh you know, my peers who support this type of approach. Uh, I think she was a panelist last week, but I think that um, Rachel Rollins, the Suffolk County DA, gets it right. Um, you know, it's uh, it's the default to a non-prosecution on minor, minor crimes. Not an absolute prohibition on prosecution, but a simple default to know while making decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and, and you know why I'm very supportive of that? <laughs> because most of the time, those minor offenses have, I've seen them weapon, weaponized against people who look just like me. So um, that's what I talk about when I talk about the need to take protective stances. Um, an integrity conviction unit. Now, we live in a country that's supposed to rather see 10 guilty persons go free than one innocent person go to jail, except for it seems like if they look like me. Or And so, no, I, I'm all for it. And if you uncover um, bad behavior in the process, well, I'm for correcting that and doing something about that too. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's about having the courage and, and, and to, to stand up and say something and, and do the right thing. And, and you know, I, <laughs> I, I talked about this before, but one day I was sitting in church and, and she wasn't looking at me, but the pastor said, and I, but I thought she was talking to me when she said, I know some of you think you're helping, but you can't be silent and actually help. And I remember from that day on saying, you know what, it's, it's, it's about more than having these progressive protective thoughts and beliefs. <laughs> you got to be vocal about it. You got to go out there and do something about it. So from that day on, I, I, I made it a point to, you know, not be silent about it. So, you know, I, I agree with, with General Ellison and with most of the progressive <laughs> district attorneys. Um, I, I agree with that protective stance always. It doesn't surprise me one bit that you agree um, based on the, the bit I know about you and and um, and yet I know that all uh, police officers don't look like you and all police uh, union leaders don't look like you. How do what kind of pushback and how do you deal with the pushback you get from folks who who just um, are always going to stand by the cops, even when you've got. You've got a conviction integrity unit that says you didn't do it right. So that's what I talk about when I say that we get indignant instead of being interested. If somebody say police are racist, we go, I'm not racist. I'm never going to get in. No, you really should be asking yourself, wait a minute. Why would someone be saying that, you know, we as a profession are racist? Um, uh, I, I happen to be in a room full of uh, law enforcement professionals when um, the day after Senator Warren said that uh, the criminal justice system is racist from front to back or, or something like that. And there was anger and, and, and bitterness over those comments. And, you know, I, I often find myself being a quote unquote angry black man in a room and, and tried to resist it. But then I said, wait a minute, y'all, it's, it's clear at every key decision making point, minorities are disparately impacted throughout the entire criminal justice system. And somebody said, well, she should have said it like that. And I'm like, what difference does it matter? All she said, what she said was the truth is not you. It's, it's not a point in the thing that you were saying that you're part of a thing that has historically, and, and, and I think that's true of every American institution. Minorities are disparately impacted in every American institution. So, you know, to, to deny that is when you deny those basics, you, you're going to anger the folks, you know, who, who are trying to, you know, advocate for you to be protected. And um, that's why I'll, I'll never take the stance of treating an advocate like an adversary, because at the end of the day, what they come to me with, no matter how much feeling, no matter how much anger, no matter how they spew it, they're trying to be protected and they're trying to help me put a better quality product out. And so that's the, that's the stance I take uh, with it. Great, thanks. Harrison, we've been talking a lot about other the other end of the criminal justice system. Let's go back to you, though, um, managing pretrial services in the Commonwealth. Um, what we know from the national movement of pretrial justice is we've got too many people of color who are being held pretrial simply because they're poor. Um, 
Massachusetts, um, the nation is looking at different ways to, to guard against that. Tell us what you're seeing in pretrial services in Massachusetts, what's happening to be attentive to this, this, this racist um, perspective. So as, as part of the, again, Criminal Justice Reform Act of 2018, uh, a lot of the tasks fell to developing and creating the pretrial services division within probation to address many of the things that you talked about. And so one of the things that we were required to do was to develop a text notification system to reduce unnecessary detentions and warrants. And, and Attorney General Ellison, one of the first places I called was Hennepin County because I knew that they were on the launch of a system and I had some conversation with people from your state. And so here in Massachusetts last November, based on, on, on some, we launched a system. So now anywhere in the Commonwealth, you can get a text message four days before, 12 hours before your court date. And we're beginning to see the benefits of that. So where we're seeing, you know, 35% of all people who get a warrant issued somewhere around the country fail to do so because they simply forgot their court date. So we're looking to eliminate that here in Massachusetts. We know that, that there's some challenges around we supervise more often than not. You know, you've got pretrial defendants sometimes with more, convic um, more conditions of probation um, than individuals who've either been found guilty or pled guilty. So we're working to minimize those sort of effects. We are looking to work right now with Mass Health here in Massachusetts to ensure that anybody who's arraigned in the Commonwealth um, has insurance in the event that they can get treatment and programming to provide with those services upfront so that we can minimize the length of time either that they go deeper into the probation system or into the criminal justice system or the court system. So we're looking to do that. We're looking to look at data. We're looking to see how, you know, drug testing and the impact that that has um, in Massachusetts, you know, between January 1 and June 30th, we did 72,000 drug tests. And, and what it shows is that a lot of significant individuals aren't being violated and sent back to jail because we're looking at data, we're using that data to see how we are really, you know, making decision-based pro processes as it relates to violations, to, um, you, you know, on, on the pretrial end, but even on the post-dispositional end. And, you know, the Council of State Governments rank Massachusetts as number two in the country as the court that violates and send people to prison of the Department of Correction who beat us, Kansas, and we're trying to figure out how we are behind Kansas, but, but we'll figure that out and continue to work <laughs> on that. So, so, so I think that, that you, know, um, you know, we're looking at all of our systems. You know, the challenge that we always have in pretrial or in any court system, we don't control the levers of entry into the system, but a big part of what we do, we work to sort of mitigate, you know, any additional harm. And I think you were talking about culturally, and we've spent a significant amount of time focusing on training um, our probation staff to recognize race and racial bias, you know, to develop higher levels of empathy and understanding, and to also provide treatment upfront and services upfront to ensure that individuals don't go deep into the criminal justice system. So I think, you know, we've also focused on justice reinvestment initiatives that, that are honed in to, you know, you know, you were talking about housing earlier. Who would have thought that the Massachusetts Probation Service is in the housing business? We now provide housing to individuals who are you know, um, um, post-release. Um, we're providing um, coordination for better investments around mental health substance abuse disorder treatments, looking to reduce that impact because we know that some of our highest costs here in Massachusetts to our healthcare system are people who are in crisis mode or emergency services. So we're working through all of these different components to reduce that impact, not only on pretrial, but on the post disposition way. Excellent, thank you so much. I think there's a relationship, this next question comes from the audience and I think you can all touch it in particular ways, but it's, it's positioned most directly to our two um, university police executives. Um, we've been talking about racial profiling on college campuses, I dare say for five decades. Um, it was pretty, pretty focused in the, the 60s and 70s, and we're, we're back at it. Um, I know from reviews of different universities, you know, um, African-American students are stopped trying to uh, unlock their bike. Um, they're stopped by the police. You know, what are you doing here uh, on campus? What kinds of things are you doing on campuses to uh, 
I, you know, I almost said eradicate. Um, to, that would be great uh, to diminish this racial profiling aspect or the perception that police are are racially profiling students. Um, this is a great opportunity to to impact students um, and help them see police officers as resources. And yet, there's often an adversarial system set up here. So, what kind of things are happening on campus? to eliminate perspectives of racial profiling. Yolanda? I know Tufts too just came out with a report, a working group report claiming, you know, with a goal of making Tufts an anti-racist university, which is um, excellent to hear. It's a great report. It's a great report and I'm so happy to be a part of, um, of this endeavor. Um, some of the things that we have been doing um, to counter racial profiling is to, um, give our dispatchers training to ask more questions, to, to find out what makes a person look suspicious so that they can deliver actual information the, um, to the officers who are going to respond. And then in, in, in that same tone, we've asked officers to ask more questions of the dispatchers. You know, what makes this, what, what makes this uh, suspicious? Give me more so that they go in there with a the clear mind and, and, and the appropriate people go to the event. Not always does it need to be an armed officer to go to, an, a, a, to, go to um, a call for service. Um, so I think training is gonna be one of the biggest things that we, we, we harp on. Um, but I also believe that there needs to be a better complaint process. And I also think that we need to take it back a little bit and make sure that our officers who are responding to these um, calls for service uh, that, that may be laced with racial profiling are clearly identifiable and are willing to give their name, their badge number, et cetera, so that the complaint process can be um, something that's valid. And, and I think we have to make a commitment to review every incident of racial profiling or, or, or allegation of, of um, racial profiling, profiling as it comes to us. Um, and in that, in the report the, that was put forth by the students, faculty and staff um, on making this an anti-racist institution, um, that's clearly one of the things we're looking at. How do we move forward um, and acknowledge that it has occurred and what are we gonna to do to stop it? And so those, those are the things that I am working on, um, more training, um, a, a stronger complaint process and making sure that dispatchers say their names um, and officers uh, are, are easily identifiable for the complaint process. I suspect it's complicated by the fact that both of you are in city, you know, deep urban areas, right? So, so Branville, what's going on at uh, Johns Hopkins? Oh. So I've been here for a month, but I, you know, so you haven't fixed now, everything yet. A, yeah, so I'm I'm still in the the listening and learning phase. Um, but I will tell you one of the things that made this opportunity uh, uh, very attractive was the administration's commitment to make sure that public safety felt that way, felt safe for everyone on its campus. Um, this is an open campus. That means that public safety officers, law enforcement, really got no reason to come up to you any student asking them for ID or asking them what they're doing, absent being called and directed to individual based on some behavior that they observe. So, you know, I can tell you what I've done and I mentioned it earlier um, and, and, you know, coming from Philadelphia and coming from most recently from Massachusetts, Massachusetts has some of the most progressive law enforcement officials. And I'm talking about of all races in the country. I was really pleased to interact with those individuals. But, you know, recently we missed the opportunity um, to have something like data collection. I'm a social scientist, but we missed the opportunity to have data collection mandated through the legislature. Um, and most uh, police officials and law enforcement officials didn't support it. Um, and so that's a missed opportunity. We gave ourselves all this credit for being the most progressive state in the country and then miss these perfect opportunities. And when you think of it in these terms, um, you know, you can go to, MLB.com and click a couple buttons and you can find out anything you want to about your favorite player, how they hit in day games, how they hit in night games, how they hit when they got two strikes, when they get against the curveball fastball, but you can't find out anything near as detailed about your police department. Something that's actually capable, we don't like to admit it, but something that's actually capable of doing harm in the community. 
something that has actually destabilized entire communities through disproportionate you know, contacts. So it just makes sense that as social scientists, as these institutions of higher learning, that we make sure that we collect as much data as possible. And then, you know, informatics is the science of using that data for the betterment and make sure that we use that data to, uh, you know, better our interactions with individuals. So I plan on making sure that we have a robust uh, monitoring uh, program. I'm so excited you talked about data. It, it was really, um, it's work for me to get, you know, 40 minutes into a conversation without talking about the importance of data. So I'm gonna take this opening and, and, and push the data conversation a little bit. Pamerson in, in the probation department in Massachusetts, I don't know, I was on the advisory board five or six years ago, and you had probation officers who are still faxing data into central office. Um, we, are, we are not, um, at the top of our game here in Massachusetts with high quality data in the criminal justice system. And I'm gonna give um, Branville a, um, applause for what he just said about missing that opportunity. Tell us how that's going now. Tell us what, what kind of work are you doing with data? I know this is something that the Office of the Commissioner has really been working on for the last several years with support from the trial court. So I think, I mean, I thank you for the question. I think a big part of what we have done over the last actually several years, but also I, I think COVID has also provided some great opportunities to really you know, advance the use of technology. And so we just invested um, millions of dollars, not only in, in probation, but in the trial court and provided every probation officer with laptops, the ability to work remotely. You know, our whole system almost was remotely during the pandemic and still continue to supervise and keep people safe. We're looking and we have invested money, not only within research within the trial court, but within the probation service. So we are now, all of our reports are filed electronically now. So there's no more facts in the paper. So what you saw five years ago isn't happening anymore. Um, we just completed a, a study within our department. And one of the things that we were focused on to determine whether or not we were having higher levels of disparate sentences among probationers of color and our data is holding up and showing that we are consistently, you know, that our levels of consistency across the board among race, among class, and among gender. So I think it, it, we're beginning to really observe and use data. I think we know that we've got some data gaps in our metrics and we need to continue to look at that. But I think we are, we are currently in the process also of going out to bid to develop systems that will track every aspect of data um, I, I, as, as Mr. Bard was just talking about, across not only the probation service, but across the entire court system. So I think these are things that we're building on and we'll continue to expand as we develop um, a new case management system to manage our entire operation. So we're in the business of, we're currently in the process of bidding on that. What's your dream for data, Pamerson, to be able to better understand the population, but also to be able to go to the courtrooms and say, we've got a problem here. Um, what, what do you need? So I think part of, a big part of this is, I mean, you know, in addition to the demographic data, we really want to be able to measure outcomes. And I think um, we, we want to measure who's coming into our system, um, what sorts, look, I mean, you know, I, I happen to think that the best system is the system that where judges and probation officers and chief probation officers, clerks, can see in real time data the decisions that they're making and the impact and whether or not they're disparity factors within all of that. And I think that is the ideal system. But I think part of it is we're really interested in outcomes, you know, our violations. We're looking at our treatment outcomes. We're looking at our supervision. Um, we're looking at our assessment scores to try to determine. Are there disparities in there based on factors of race, class, gender, income, demographic, where people live, who they live, you know, family history and context, all of those static factors that, that often, more often that could bring young men and women of color into the system. So I think a big part of this is how we measure those outcomes and whether or not our decision making are you know, um, resulting in disparate outcomes for people based on race and class and all of the other factors that we know are problematic within the criminal justice system. Great, thanks. Keith, what kind of data do you rely on in the Attorney General's office to sort of understand or, or manage, manage your staff or to understand what kind of initiatives you should be taking on? 
Well, there's a whole bunch of data sets that we rely on. And I can tell you that I think that when it comes to um, the uh, you know officer involved shootings or deadly force encounters of whether it involves a gun or not, we don't have a great data set set on that. And it's hard to make good policy when you don't know the scale of the problem. Uh, in a, in, and we also don't have great data uh, on, on what, what would it mean if we were to not um, hold juveniles in, uh, in confinement just sort of presumptively? You know, what if, we, what if we called them? What if we let them out? Uh, would, would, we, would we really have a lot of no-shows? Would we really have a lot of reoffending, or would or not? Uh, you know, Hennepin County tried this experiment and found out that it actually is working out pretty well, saving the county. And even more important than that, we found that deten juvenile detention is 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 consistent with adult of offend, uh, offending, right? So actually, it's a traumatic thing to keep a kid confined, which will probably lead them to a life of of of, uh, of crime. Whereas if we can find ways to reunite them with their family, that might be more consistent with law-abiding behavior in adult years. So, I mean, we have a lot of data that is missing. Uh, you know, just the other day, we were talking about hate crimes in Minnesota, and we have a very poor data set when it comes to that. And, uh, you know, so, you know, how many? Um, I mean, if the officers are not capturing how often, you know, um, you know uh, hate crimes are occurring or miss categorizing it or not reflecting that in the police report, can we really say that we're keeping community as safe as we could? Um, so that, so that it, data is really important. It should drive our uh, policy making. Uh, and in fact, I just wanna say, Christine, that you know, so often people fear the other side of reform. They're like, well, if we do these reforms, if we do all this stuff to make society uh, more constitutional, uh, more observant of everyone's human rights, well, that will that will then undermine public safety. And uh, but the truth is, it'll actually enhance public safety. You know, it'll actually make society safer. I mean, the that I mean, I think one of the things that we have not really tabulated is the cost of the lack of trust. It means people don't report crimes that they should. They don't uh, respond to the subpoena when they should, and that lets people who would commit crimes in our neighborhoods individuals who would do so have a freer hand to do so. And so uh, it's, it's really unfortunate, you know, when we don't have the data and when we don't have the trust that we need uh, to bring about the, the service of safety and security in our neighborhoods and communities. Boy, there's like 14 things I wanna follow up on <laughs> between the two of you. And Branville going like this, when you're talking about um, locking up young people, is uh, correlates with a, a, a longer or, or a longer criminal career, perhaps. One of the things, and I don't have a number in my head, but one of the things I hear about is sometimes people of, of good intent, um, often judges or maybe even prosecutors, recommend that a young person be held to protect him or her um, because there there's difficulty at home or parents or are falling down on their responsibility, or if we let this kid go home, bad things will continue to happen. Um, that's so misplaced in, in, in so many ways, right? We're penalizing a young person for the bad behavior of a, of a parent. Um, how, how can we disrupt that cycle? What do we say to, how do we help people understand that in spite of your good intent, this is not the way to go? Well, let, I'll just say this. If you got a child protection case, you got a child protection case and we should figure out what to do about that child protection case. But don't give me a juvenile case and then say that mom's not a good parent. You know, I mean, look, if mom has two jobs and you don't believe you can secure safety and return that kid to court, maybe you explore, you know, an accelerated monitoring system or something like that. But the kid is better off at home unless the kid is in danger at home, right? Because, because look, as a prosecutor, I'm not gonna send a kid home where somebody's gonna abuse, assault, uh, rape them or do things to them. If, so there's a legitimate reason to take a child out of a home sometimes. But 
it's not legitimate to say, well, you know, this mom's just not exactly Claire Huxtable, so we're taking the kid. You know, that, that ain't gonna work. You know, by the way, kids wanna be home. You know, they wanna be with their family. They wanna be up under their family's tutelage. So I think that this paternalistic thing of second judging black parenting is, is wrong. It does not help kids, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if you got a legitimate, um, uh, I think in Massachusetts, y'all call them chins cases, we call yeah. them chips cases in Minnesota. I don't want to mix the two, they're two separate issues, uh, but uh, paternalistic second guessing of black parenting is, is, is not helping anyone and probably hurting yeah. a lot of people. Just I particularly like the way you term it. Go ahead, Randall. Yeah, just to pick it back off of A.G. Ellison, don't, don't conflate the two, you know, it, you, you know, if you got a juvenile justice case, then that's what that is. And a protective custody case is a whole different thing. But we know, and that's where I was, one of the things I bragged about Cambridge all the time was the safety net collaborative. Um, what it did was it took young people who exhibited criminal or juvenile um, or troubling behavior and deflected them around, not put them in and diverted them, but deflected them away from the juvenile justice system. We know that anytime, and A.G. Ellison said it, anytime a young person comes in contact with the juvenile justice system, that they're seven times more likely as an adult to be involved with the criminal justice system. So it just makes all due sense not to put them in contact with the juvenile justice system. So the collaborative in Cambridge, the way it worked, it was a partnership between the schools, the police, um, public, uh, public health, and uh, programs, uh, Department of Human Service programs, excuse me, and it provided wraparound services for that young person and their family. Because sometimes we know I'm only acting up because my mom is spending all her time with my autistic brother um, and doesn't know how to properly deal with it or she got two jobs. So it provides the wraparound services for that young person and their family. And it keeps them away from the juvenile justice system right. period is that protective stance that I'll always talk about. So yeah, uh, don't conflate the two. It, it, right. it, it rarely ever, and, and I like the term, Second, second guess in black parenting. Because I'm parenting in a way that I'm I, that you necessarily would. It doesn't mean that it's inappropriate. That, you know, so don't complain. Yeah, thanks for that language. Yeah. I was going to say that here in Massachusetts, you, you, we've been very aggressive within the juvenile system and diverting and removing children from progressing deeper into the adult system or into the uh, the delinquency system. So I think. There is a lot of truth and emphasis to both, you know, Mr. Allison as well as Mr. Bard's conversation. Can I just add that, you know, in, in Massachusetts, maybe not Cambridge, and, and Bramville, you went ahead of me, so you so you said some of the things I was <laughs> going to say, but I, I, I want to point out that um, back to data and data sharing, we don't, we're not so good at that in Massachusetts. And sometimes when, you know, these children and even adults are criminal justice involved and involved in other entities. And when they finally make it before a judge, the judge doesn't have all the information about this person to make a holistic decision on what's best for, for him or her. And so we, in Massachusetts, we, you know, the trial court, the corrections, the municipality policing, um, uh, DCF, uh, Department of Children, Children and Families, whatever that acronym is, um, we got to be able to talk more and, and understand what's going on with someone because, you know, diversion should be the first thing we do for, for a child for all kinds of reasons that have been stated already. And for that to happen, we definitely have to have more data sharing and more data collection. Great, thanks. Um, I want to invite the audience. Um, we've had a couple of questions. I'm going to ask an audience question now, but please feel free to put something in the Q&A. Um, we're, we're happy to take those questions. Um, one of the questions that we got, I, I think I'm going to start with you, um, Keith, with the answer, is we, we haven't, we hear a lot in the media about the particularly police misconduct. Um, we don't care about the cost. I've been involved in a couple of consent decree cases in, in major cities and other parts of the country. And um, the litigation costs are outrageous when you think about consent decrees. And by the time you get to a consent decree, there's clearly a pattern and a practice of misconduct that the city has often had to pay for <laughs> um, in civil litigation, um, paying out um, litigants, uh, complainants, and, um, and people stay on their jobs. 
I, I wonder if there's something that we can do so that the, the costs are made more clear to the public. And my fear is that some of these costs are covered by insurance and therefore the municipality sort of writes it off. Um, and yet the costs are extraordinary. What do you, what, how do we make those costs more clear to the public and hold some of our local jurisdictions accountable for their failure to deal with the problem? Because we know that the impact of the bad behavior is disproportionately on people of color. Well, you know, let me just mention a few costs that just popped to mind. Number one, you know, there's the loss of life. Uh, oh. the, and, you know, and then, yes. and then let me go, you mentioned the settlements in Minnesota. Uh, they, we had to pay out 27 million for the murder of George Floyd, 20, 20 million for a woman named Justine Ruschek. That's 47 million in two cases. And we got much, much more that we paid out than that. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, 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 all kinds of folks you can't hire, all kinds of equipment you can't buy. You mentioned litigation costs, good costs. We all pay entire, we all pay insurance companies. With that, you may your premiums are going up when you have uh, a, you know a, a situation like that. Civil unrest. You can It's hard to identify an explosion of civil unrest in the twentieth and twenty first century that was not sparked by bad by a police com, police community issue. 1919 Chicago riot involved police. 1935, same thing. 1943, same thing. 1960, all the riots in 67 that, that, that brought the Kerner Commission reports together from Detroit to Watts, you name it. Uh, even even um, the Obama's 21st century policing was convened because of Ferguson. And, you know, but then why stop there? Recruiting. Uh, anybody in the police field will tell you that recruiting is tougher than it used to be. People think it's because, oh, the police get a lot of crit critiques. Well, I know a lady named Carrie L. Horn who loved being a cop. She was a Buffalo police officer and her partner uh, intervened with excessive force on an arrestee. She, she tried to intervene to stop it. Not only did her partner, a cop, punch her in the face, he went and said that he, she interfered with a lawful arrest and she gets, guess what, fired. And so think about being a, a young cop, 21 years old, full of hope, full of, you wanna do what's right, you wanna help people. And you see Derek Chauvin do what he did. I put it like this, my kid was in the military for five years, got out and wanted to think about a job in public service. I mean, you know, he's a smart kid, but he wasn't exactly valedictorian, right? So he wants to do a hands-on type job. And so he, he was thinking about being a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, something like that. He decides he doesn't wanna be a police officer because he doesn't wanna associate with some of the people in that department. So where's your recruiting problem coming from? It's not because the police are criticized, it's because we allow bad cops to book, to sort of take over the department, you know? Uh, and, and nobody wants to do that. But then let me just add one other thing you know, one of the things that we have to pay attention to is that Vladimir Putin knows that we have deep racial divisions and we have police accountability problems and was using all types of social media and everything else to try to sow division within the United States. I'm telling you that our problems with racial division and policing are a national security problem. When you think about nations hostile to the United States, can manipulate conflict within the United States and make us weaken ourselves internally. I mean, the, the world saw what happened to George Floyd. The world saw it. So when people think, oh, the United States, you can get a fair trial there. You can get treated with justice there. If we keep it up, people aren't gonna believe that. So we're law So those are just a few of the costs that we pay. And I think we've got to count up the bill because if we don't, you know, people just think, oh, well, uh, better just to keep an unsatisfactory status quo. Now, uh, I think we need reforms, as all of the panelists are saying. And I think that the other side of reform is, is, is lower costs, for one, pres preservation of life, two, better law enforcement, because you're going to have better cooperation, three. Absolutely. And I'll just stop right there. Those are, those are some of the big benefits. Anybody else on this topic? 
I'll just add that, um, you know, it, it'd be naive to think that, like most, most of the time, these costs tend to be budget neutral. Uh, city, municipality X self indemnifies. So that means that they take a pile of cash and put it aside based on what they right. incur annually in these suits. And so they pay it out from this pile of cash, which means it was budgeted for and it's budget neutral. And so it doesn't really hurt or impact. But the cost of bad behavior, I don't know that you can quantify it. I mean, it manifests itself so more than just that dollar amount. A.G. Ellison talked about, um, you know, folks being unwilling to come forward. Now think about this. It should offend your sensibilities as a law enforcement practitioner to think that somebody could experience the most horrific victimization possible but then won't call you because they're worried about being victimized again. Like, you know, just like imagine the cost of that. And can you quantify even that? And I mean, you could, we could sit here and talk for two weeks and days and semesters about the cost of those bad behaviors. But we got to, as a law enforcement across the board, we got to raise the cost of bad behavior. I often say we're some of the bravest cowards you ever going to come across. You know, we're getting to a shootout, we're running to a burning building, but we won't, you know, tell on our fellow officer who clearly stepped across the line because we, of the peer pressure. But not nah, raise the cost of bad behavior, period. Well, and Randall, you talked earlier about the missed opportunity in Massachusetts from the police executives who wouldn't support data collection. That's a form of cowardice, too. Oh, oh, absolutely. And, and you know, to borrow a line from a 90s movie, Pulp Fiction, you know, we, we don't ask scary questions because we think that the answer going to frighten us. And, and we worry about that a, a lot of times. Pamson, I, I think about the, the, the late, great Chief Justice Gantz and the, the, um, the study he commissioned through Harvard Law School to look at race and racism in the Massachusetts court system. And what was so appalling um, was not only the racial bias, but the absence of data. Um, that the, if I recall, the researchers said, we, we see this kind of bias, but we can't even tell you how bad the bias is because there's so many data points that are missing. You mentioned earlier about um, uh, procurements that have been made to, to fill in some of those gaps. I think that we've seen great courage from the trial court to try and fix this wrong. How are you experiencing that in, in your life, in your work with, with people on probation um, in pretrial or with the probation officers you oversee? So I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, one, a couple of things have happened within the trial court over the last few years. And, 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 and I think we already knew that there were gaps in the data. I think the data is better now than it was when the Harvard team looked at it. And, and I, so I think there are significant investments being made in having the right kind of technology and software to do this work. And I think, you know, we, again, we just, we've invested in units that, you know, we've got a research team right now in probation. There's a department of research and planning within the trial court. They continue to invest resources. So I think a big part of this continues to be, I mean, looking at cases, looking at the volume of cases, the type of cases, our failure to array of pay rates. And look, the Harvard report is a problem for us within the child code. And I think it is one that we've acknowledged that we've got some issues and we've got some work to do. And I think over the next six to eight months, as we look at our strategic plans and we focus the data and data collection, I think we will continue, we will see better data across the Commonwealth. Um, I've just learned that um, General Allison needs to hop off. Do you have any final words that you want to leave with us? You know, all I want to say is, you know, I get to do panels, uh, you know, now and again. I have been so thrilled to serve with these three folks. You guys are doing tremendous things, and I'm so proud of you. Please keep it up. Absolutely. Uh, and I just want to uh, close by saying, you all saw the George Floyd trial or pieces of it here and there. And you may have remembered a nine-year-old girl on the scene yes. watching this unfold. Now she's nine. She's going to be 29 one day. Maybe she'll be a mom, 39. Maybe she'll have a few kids by then, be a parent. What will she tell them about how she feels about the people whose job it is to protect and serve her? We've got to do better. We absolutely have to. 
because the future depends upon it, the present depends upon it. So I just say, bless you guys and forgive me for having to leave early. And I really don't want to because I love everything that I'm hearing and I'm learning a lot, but let's stay in touch. All right. Yep. Thank you so very much for being with us. Bye. Um, thank you, Parmesan. I almost cut you off because he texted me to say he had to go. Yep. My apologies to you. That was um, not meant to be rude to you, but I didn't want him to disappear without saying goodbye. No, I, I'm fine. I, I, again, I think we are beginning to, you know, really analyze and evade if, and, um, assess the data. And, and one of the more, for the first time ever in the probation service history, we took a look again, we just evaluated our violations and, and, and types of offense, types of violations, different technical reasons, uh, new offenses. And I think the data is really revealing. And I think it's a good measure of some of the questions that we're not only asking ourselves, but we're looking back at the Harvard report to determine whether or not we, we've got some really issues as it relates to disparity in our sentencing and recommendation. And I think the data holds it well. That said, I still think we've got challenges because again, we don't control the volume and the types of individuals that come before the court system. And this isn't a knock against anyone, you know, but more often than not, probation is left holding the bag as to the supervision, the monitoring, the treatment, and, and the public safety aspects of it. And I think we've placed great emphasis on how we, um, you know, we assess, analyze, evaluate, provide, um, you know, evidence-based supervision practices. And I think, in, you know, compared to the rest of the country, I think we're doing a great job. But I also think, again, we recognize that we've got some challenges within the work that we do and the availability of data that we have. Thank you. I've got one last question, and then I'm going to ask each of you, give you each the opportunity to sort of make a closing statement, so to speak, if you'd like. Um, you know, each of you are um, champions for racial justice, and I thank you for that. Each of you are extraordinary in your professional career and the work you do. Um, Branville and Yolanda, you just left positions for new ones. So my, my question is, is funny because you just had a job change, but I'd, I'd love to know from all three of you, what do you do to keep the momentum going? This, this advocacy for racial justice with, with staff that you leave behind. Pamerson, one day you're gonna move on too. How do we make sure there's sustainability for your efforts? So this quest for racial justice this, this excellence in performance in the criminal justice system doesn't leave when you do. Granville? So for me, it's about gatekeeping. Um, when I was hired here and when I was hired in Cambridge, one of the things that they wanted to make sure of was that um, the progressive efforts and the reform-minded efforts that had been started before me, that I would continue those. And so um, me, you know, and, and my replacement came from within. So I had time to, to work with her and to ensure that she was like-minded, that she brought in to it, because there's gonna be um, an underbelly trying to pull you back, you know, to the meat, to the meat, you know, to the center, uh, away from the progressive protective stances. And so when you understand that, you, you make sure that you gatekeep and you only, you know, allow those individuals who are like-minded and reform-minded to advance, you know, into those positions of, of power. So I think I think we did a good thing selecting Christine Elo to So you you were pretty particular at about who you promoted and where you promoted them to. Well it was the city manager who who promoted or appointed her to the acting position, but I, I did have a recommendation and, and yeah. she made a recommendation. Great. Thanks. Yolanda? So as the special sheriff, I was in a unique position to be able to um, interview anyone that I was going to hire to work at the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department. And so I, um, I appreciated my time spent with all candidates um, to make sure that they were invested in social justice and second chances. Um, and I've always been one to promote folks who were like-minded and, and, and wanted to see um, uh, uh, us as a department rid ourselves of um, biases and um, disparities. And so um, I feel like I was comfortable leaving because 
we had a cadre of supervisors who um, were moving this conversation along on how we can be better practitioners in criminal justice and how we can how we could um, uh, meet the needs of the people we were serving. So, um, you know, while I, I, I will admittedly say I miss working there because there's something about working for people, for advocating for people who can't always advocate for themselves, but I'm very comfortable with the folks who are still there doing the work. Great, thanks. Amberson, and I'm not hoping that you go anywhere soon or anything. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, no, we'll see. <laughs> So look, I, I, I think a big part of this is, you know, I love working for the trial court and I love the work that I do, but I know that the pathway and the trajectory there has been a difficult and long one. And, and so for me, I think, you know, sometimes when you look around and see other folks that, 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 that sort of matriculate differently, you want to make sure that the process should be the same for everyone. That said, you know, I think it is incumbent that we as a trial court and we as a system look like the, the communities and the people that we serve. And I think, you know, whether or not it is lived experience or empathy and understanding, if we're really concerned about equal access to justice, then we want to hire the best people. We want to hire the best talent. And that talent, I don't care, isn't confined to one race or group of people. And if we really want to serve people, we need to not only look like them, but we also need to be recruiting and have talented folks from every we get his race, class, gender, and society. And I'll leave this at one point. I'm six foot three, 255 pounds. And I know that on any given day, if I'm dressed differently and I'm in a courtroom in Massachusetts, I might be someone that a judge or, or, or a prosecutor or a probation officer may consider to be a dangerous person if I'm charged with an offense. And it is just based solely on how I look. So, so that is always on the back of my mind that we need to get people in who understand that perception and remove that profession perception from across the criminal justice system. Do you share that concept that you just shared with us with people at work? Do you use all that the, to help them understand? All the time. I do, yeah. you know, for all of our new probation employees, I'm involved in part of the um, orientation process as a really of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and so when we talk about accessibility and equal access to justice, I share that because I've gone to courthouses where people have mistaken me for a defendant or asked me to wait in line or take a number. I've gone, I've been going through the back door with, with police officers and another prosecutor would ask them if I was there lunchtime arrest. I've gone to courthouses where, 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 where you know, I'll call judges based on my role and title and people say, why would you be calling a judge? So I know that and I live that as a, as a deputy commissioner. So I could only imagine people walking into the front counters of, of, of courthouses or in courtrooms. I've had colleagues of color who have talked about being told that you don't, that they're lawyers, that you don't belong, or why don't you wait over on that side? This is only for prosecutors and court employees. So look, we live this every day. And, and look, there are a lot of great folks in the trial court who are fighting that, but we are a microcosm of a lot of, you know, community and society. So we, just as much as we have these issues on the outside, we have them internally. And there's been a lot of investment in working to fix some of that and again, hire some of the best talent. So that is what motivates me every day because I, I can't promise you that I can't, I may not go to a building or a courthouse and still not be treated black first in the trial court employee sector. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happens. Um, and, it, it, I, uh, and I know it does. Yeah. 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 Um, we're going to shortly turn this back over to Chief Justice Ireland. Um, I'd, I'd love to give each of you a, a moment to share or reflect or leave us with some parting words. And um, we'll go Branville, Yolanda, and Pamerson, just because uh, he was the last to speak. So uh, we'll give him a minute to catch up. Thank you. Well, you start with me. I'll, I'll just say thanks for... Uh, and invite me to this discussion on reform. It's, it's been, you know, from my viewpoint, wonderful, and the contributions have been amazing from, from all my fellow panelists. I just want to say that from a practical standpoint, just let's always remember that improvements cost money, and reform means in, in improvement. So um, it, it defies reason to think that taking money away from something is going to improve a condition. So uh, that's why I always say that the defending position is impractical. If you can divorce your emotion from the equation and reduce it to a practical consideration, reform is likely to cost money. Um, it, it's something that you can't afford not to do. Um, and so 
Thanks for having me. And, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you so much for being with us. Yolanda? Oh, you're on mute. Um, I'm just going to really echo a lot of what my uh, co-panelists have said. I want to thank you, Christine, for a very great um, holistic conversation. And um, I, 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 my takeaway today, um, there, there was a plethora of things that I that I will think about and and and, and move the conversation on. But I want to say, you know, Congresswoman um, Presley, the people closest. To, she said the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power that is so impactful to me and something that I will requote and give her credit, but you use um, in, in my uh, in my platforms. And I, I just want to say thank you to all of my the panelists. I've learned so much and I, I appreciate it. And, and don't stop inviting me. Oh, you were great. Thank you so much. Harrison? Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Grand, uh, Granville. Um, look, I, I, I think it's, it's been a pleasure um, it is always good to learn from other professionals and hear their experiences and perspectives. And I think, you know, I love the Massachusetts trial court and I, I think we do grow with work, but I also think we've got some ways to grow and improve. And I think the more transparency we have around these, these, these issues, I think the better system we will be as we move forward. Great, thanks. So thank you. You know, I said at the beginning that the only thing missing with Zoom is the ability to stand up and give applause. But I, I, on behalf of the members of the audience, let me let me do that for each one of you. It, and, and for Keith, who had to leave us early. I, I felt that this has been an extraordinary conversation. I so appreciate the gift of each one of you and the work that you do every day. Um, there's so much to share. There's so much to learn. I only wish we had hundreds of people um, with us today. Um, thank you all very much. And I'll turn it back to Chief Ireland. Well, Christine and members of the panel, thank you folks so much for such an outstanding uh, discussion. This was really exceptional. Thank you very much. Well, here we are at the end of our second session. and. We sincerely want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon as we continue our discussion on criminal justice reform. We sincerely hope that you have enjoyed today's session and that it highlighted for you some of the critical issues that we all face at this time. We look forward to your joining us next week for our final session entitled Healing the Community and ourselves. Our keynote speaker will be Northeastern University law professor and former judge, Margaret Burnham, followed by another panel of outstanding professionals. Our hope is that these three sessions on criminal justice reform will lead to conversations and dialogue about criminal justice reform. In the end, we know that without open communication, things won't and can't change. And criminal justice reform is all about change. I also want to take this opportunity to remind you that the Ruffin Society is a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and donations fuel our work. And if you would like to contribute to the Ruffin Society, you can do so by going to the Convocation website. Just click on the heading that says more, and then click on the entry that says donate to the Ruffin Society. Thank you for your support. And with that, I thank you again for joining us on behalf of Northeastern University the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and the Justice George Lewis Ruffin Society. Have a great evening, everyone, and I hope to see you a week from today for our final session. Good night. Thank you.